When you see things like that, or people trying to say like you're a scammer, you're faking withdrawals, and then you, yeah. afterwards you showed FTMO, yeah. like, what are your thoughts when you read all these things or have these people's opinions? So like, personally for me, Welcome everyone back to the Words of Wisdom podcast. We are back once again. We're still in Miami and we are joined by the one, the only, Mr. Lambo Raul. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, bro. It's, uh, it's an honor. Like I said before, I've been seeing your guys' page grow like crazy. And it's, it's amazing that uh, you invited me onto the podcast. I really appreciate this opportunity, bro. It's my pleasure, man. And thank you for hosting us in, in, no, of course, in no your problem. space, man. It's incredible. And the, uh, Thank I'd you. love to see it when it's like you got your, your events going and everything as well. Yeah, yeah, like the space right now is still a bit under construction as, <laughs> as you could see. But it's, uh, it's a work in progress like anything right now. Definitely, man. And, you know, a lot of people out there no doubt know who you are and you're a bit about your journey. But for those who don't, can you just give us a, a brief introduction to sort of how you got to where you are today? Yeah, so um, for those of you guys that don't know me, my name is Raul. I'm a full-time day trader. I own multiple online businesses and I've been trading for roughly the last six years mm -hmm now or so so i started day trading when i was 17 i opened up my first live account at 18 years old and it's just been non-stop ever since then you know like a lot of people ask me all the time like oh how did you get started well honestly with me how i got started i feel like it's a little bit of an unconventional story um so i was in high school i didn't really know what i wanted to do in my life because my dad always instilled like you got to start a business you know like look what i have mm -hmm. you have to go out and get this on your own like this is not easy because a big misconception about me that a lot of people have is that it, everything was just handed to me by my dad. That's the one thing because my dad, he is a very successful man, but he's always said to himself, like, I'm not a rich guy. I'm a hardworking individual. There's a big difference between being a rich guy and a very hardworking individual. Like, the biggest example that I had in my life was my dad because I had seen him, you know, going from driving Ferraris to Porsches to then having to go through a divorce mm -hmm. and having absolutely nothing, living back at his parents' house and starting from ground zero again mm -hmm. to building the massive empire that my dad has now. And that was the example that was set for me very early on. So I took that and I basically ran with that example. And, you know, when I started trading, it wasn't really like uh, I wanted to get into trading. So I was 17 years old. I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And I was really into like, the military and different things like that. And I just saw, you know what, like maybe I'll go to the military for a few years mm -hmm. and, you know, we'll just kind of see what happens after. I didn't really want to, because my dad, he's a dentist and he owns um, different investments, online businesses as well. Um, I didn't really want to do that. I didn't really catch my interest. So I'm like, you know what, let's just go to the military, right? And when I was roughly like 16, turning 17 mm -hmm. years old, um, really everything started at 15, but uh, I was going to the hospital a lot for stomach pains. I'm telling you, like, every single month I was in the hospital for probably like a week or two weeks just staying there having the doctors analyze me and nobody found mm. what was wrong with me for the first year and I was going for like this horrible 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 intestinal pain and I just I, I couldn't explain like the type of pain like I remember one day I was walking from the lunchroom to mm -hmm. my next class which was a French class right and I was walking and when I walked into that cafeteria like the smell of the food it was just it was hurting my stomach and I, I, I couldn't bear even just smelling the food. So as I was leaving the cafeteria, I remember this feeling, I'll never forget it. It literally felt like someone grabbed a knife and just like slashed my stomach open. It was the worst feeling I could possibly describe. I fell to the floor mm. and I don't know how, but I ended up walking myself to the classroom. Obviously the teachers knew something was wrong and I had to get wheelchair out and I was in the hospital and after that I was in the hospital for two weeks. I mean, I had a surgery, I had my appendix removed. I mean, I was probably like 130 pounds. I was anemic and it was just like a really hard point in my life and then obviously at that point in time I, f uh, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease about a year later wow. right and I found out that I couldn't join the military with Crohn's disease because you need constant treatment mm -hmm. and you have flare-ups and different things along those lines so it's like like what do I do next right so then I just literally looked up different ways to make money online that's when I came upon stock trading then I came upon Forex and that's how I kind of got introduced into this world mm -hmm. I bought my first course. I remember I had a motorcycle, right? I had a CBR 600, mm -hmm. literally from 2001 that I spent all of my money on. <laughs> Every single cent, I, like I had to my name, like $3,000, right? I spent it on that motorcycle. My parents were like, nope, you're living under my house. You got to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well, 
I got rid of the bike. I had maybe three grand left again, right? I spent $1,500 on a course and I put $500 into my lab account. And ever since then, it was, it's, it's been like a, a nonstop game of learning how to trade and continuing to trade. That's kind of how I got started. Definitely, and uh, we'll start with that. So obviously, <coughs> as you said there about your, your father, which I actually got to meet at the, at the yeah. summit, which was incredible. I actually tried to say like, why don't you just come over? <laughs> <I want> to, <laughs> yeah. Only because, um, not even because of him, which obviously in his own right, as you said, a very successful person. It was literally because, and I said the same thing to Roy's father, you know, the host of the FX yeah, Summit. Yeah. I said the same thing, because I want to hear their perspective of seeing what their sons have achieved, you know, yeah. for the pod. But um, I didn't want to like be too pushy. Right? <laughs> no, no, my but, dad um, would have been my dad would have been honored. He was like the coolest guy you'd ever meet. He seems it. No, hundred yeah, yeah, yeah. percent. He has such great energy, and he was yeah, yeah, yeah. he was so polite, and he doesn't even know who I am, but was so um, you know polite and, and welcoming as well. So yeah. But as, as you said, like there's a misconception, as you say, like there's a lot of uh, chatter online. It's the usual case. It'll be like yeah, of course, your father gave it you, or your of father course, gave you all these opportunities. So when you hear that, and as you said that you went through your own journey. You know, yeah. and, and you've seen your father go through his own journey. So it wasn't yeah. like your father was always where he was. You've seen no, him actually go back. He, yeah, mm -hmm. he completely went down to zero, living back at his parents' house. Mm -hmm. Imagine being, I think he was maybe like 30, 30-something 30 at the mm -hmm. time. I was probably like 12 years old or so. Mm -hmm. um, so that would make him like, let's call it 42, mm -hmm. right? Seeing a 42-year-old man go back to living at his parents' house, going through divorce and having three kids and then building himself back from zero. Mm. That was like the biggest motivational story that I needed to see. That's, it was right there in front of my face, you know, in my family. Wow. And, and what does that do for you in, in terms of experiencing that and, and then witnessing that? I mean, obviously as a kid, I didn't know it at the time, um, but after speaking to my dad about it and, and obviously like experiencing it and having those memories, it's um, really humbling. I have a lot of respect for my dad because for our family, He'll do anything, mm -hmm. and he'll always put the family first. Now, obviously, like the big, biggest misconception that obviously a lot of people have had is like, oh, he's handed us everything. That's that's just simply not the case. You know, it would have made life obviously a lot easier. Um, but yeah, it, it just wasn't the case. You know, like I know my story. Um, now he's helped me a lot. You know, he's guided me in the right ways, how to save money, how to invest money, what to do with my money. But it wasn't like, oh, you know, here's son, here's. $25,000, you know, go ahead, go do whatever you want with it. It wasn't just like that, as um, as many people would probably assume, like the typical rich dad mm -hmm. or trust fund kid online. Like I said again, like I think the people that have the misconception of that is uh, just simply because they don't know. They don't know how much hard work I put it in. My dad says all the time, like everything that I have, I was able to get on my own solely through my own hard work efforts. And it kind of just shows because I'm in a completely different industry then my dad is and like when we talk about like some of the numbers that I pull in, he's like, damn, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. So yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that actually, because normally it's the case where, you know, when people come from money, no one knows where the money is, right? They know yeah. they don't know who the parents are. Of while course. your father obviously, as you said, is vocal and and, and you see him around. I've I've met him myself and of course. for him to then reinforce what you're saying isn't usually the case then, because normally if it is the case where he's giving you the money, they would probably yeah. turn around and be like, no, no, <laughs> I gave him that, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 of course, of course. And I think, honestly, like, he did his job right. Mm. You know what I mean? Because now that I'm also a father, I want my kids mm -hmm. to also be the kids that are like, oh, that's just daddy's money. Mm. You know what I mean? Because to me, it's like, that's the parents doing their job and going above and beyond for their kids. And when you have your kids being called, oh, you know, your dad has all this money, this, this, and that, it's like, he's providing, he's doing well, mm -hmm, you definitely. know? Well, congratulations, by the way. I, I was going to lead on to that eventually. But yeah, congratulations. What's Thank it been you. like, obviously, having your child? It's crazy, honestly. Um, uh, I mean, holding my daughter for the first time was the most humbling experience. Um, and it just gives me more purpose. Mm. You know what I mean? Because now it's not just about like going and getting the, 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 the next best car or the next nicest watch or the nicest house. Now it's like I want to provide and give the best life possible, mm -hmm. the best quality of life possible to my family, to my daughter, you know. I want to be able to put her in the best schools and just make sure she's gonna be good. So that's like the purpose that I have right mm -hmm. now. You know, it's not just about me anymore, it's about the little one. And so if you felt that shift then, so before that was oh, coming, you would have been probably thinking about buying these next things. Oh, 100%. But now you've 100%. seen the shift of, okay, let me stop doing that or avert from there. A hundred percent, like, 
I was actually really contemplating about buying one of my dream cars, which was a, a McLaren Senna. And for those of the people that follow me and that are really close to me, um, they know that's like my ultimate dream car. And I was, I'm, I was so close. I'm telling you, I had the deal set up on the table. All I had to do was sign and send the wire. And I stopped myself because it's like, right now I'm living in a, in a rental because I sold my last property for a big profit. And it's like, no, I need to get my family at home. Mm. You know, I need my daughter to have stability in her life. So I put essentially my uh, my goals, my wishes to the side for, you know, my daughter, my picture, wife, yeah. the baby. No, definitely. And one thing actually to revert back to your father, for example, do you think it was beneficial for you to have the experience of some form of success as well? Have the example of 100%. success? 100%. But then also like with the cars, for example, like if your dad had a car, you were able to then, you know, people talk about the law of attraction. Right? And they say, you know, go experience it, you know? While most people don't have maybe a chance to experience it at that level, do you think that was helpful for you to have already 100%. experienced these things? 100%. I remember because this was maybe a few years ago, I had a Lamborghini Huracan and I was going through my own success. You know, I was making, I was making maybe decent money at the time. I was making probably like $30,000 or so um, monthly and the car note cost me for the Lamborghini Huracan like $3,500 mm -hmm. a month. And my dad had gotten himself a brand new Lamborghini Aventador with red interior. It was absolutely beautiful. And I remember one day I took it out for a drive and I'm like, wow, like I'm gonna do whatever it takes so that I can afford this mm -hmm. on my own. And that's like another moment that I'll never forget because not just seeing him accomplish what he's been able to accomplish, but like him being able to just go and grab himself an Aventador without even having to think about it was just like so motivating for me. And it, it really put like this fire under me where it's like, I thought I was doing great. You know what I mean? I was maybe 20 years old. I had a, 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 a brand new Lamborghini at that time, you know, paying $3,500 a month for it. And I was making maybe like, I don't know, like four, almost $400,000 mm -hmm. a year at that point in time. I'm like, bro, like there's so many more levels to reach. Mm. And just seeing my dad being like way up here and I'm like way down here and, and driving his car. I'm like, I need to be able to afford one of these. Mm. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get to that point. Amazing. And you know, going back to obviously having a child now, I've seen you're very, you know, still fam you're very family oriented anyway, but you, you bring your family with you to events. Yeah, like you, of course. you brought your family here, for example. Of course. And so you brought your family to the summit, for example. Yeah. And I see on your social media as well, like you're always traveling with your family as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, is that how important is the family to you? And obviously, you're still not changing necessarily. At the end of the day, you haven't had to change your schedule, then you're, you're making sure they're included in your schedule as well. Yeah, of course. So, I mean, I'm very blessed to have the family that I had. I mean, my mom, my sister, they were at the summit helping out with the booths, making sure everybody was okay, making sure everybody's needs were met too. You know what I mean? And that's something that my dad instilled on me. I recently got married as well on December 28th mm. um, last year. And honestly, getting married and being with, my wife has allowed me to mature a lot quicker mm -hmm. than I have because I feel like I was on a very, I don't want to say destructive path, but it was just a very selfish path. Like last year I was out partying like crazy. Um, and I really like, not, not that my goals weren't in line and I wasn't focused, but it was just more like, I'm going to do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I didn't mind going and blowing $40,000 on a weekend, literally just going out and having fun. You know what I mean? And going back on it, I mean, like, not that I regret it because life is an experience, mm -hmm. you know, um, but definitely now that I have a family and now that I'm married, I'm a lot, I'm in a better road. I'm Use that responsibility. Yeah. yeah, no, 100%, 100%. And I have to honestly give a lot of thank you to my wife because she's been able to help me realize mm. the mistakes that I've done in my past mm -hmm. and how I can avoid those same mistakes. And again, like, I've only been able to level up so much harder because of her and because of her being by my side, mm. obviously helping me with, or essentially me helping her mm. um, with the baby, but also just like the family morals that she has, you know what I mean? She's been able to allow me to mature mm -hmm. a lot quicker because like, I, I don't want to say I wasn't happy with the person that I was before, but I've definitely gone through a big change and I've been changing a lot and that's because of her. That's so incredible. I really do have to, to thank her for that. No, incredible. Because that's a, co a common question I try to ask people when they are married or have a, a long-term partner is that how important that is uh, in terms of change or success. Oh, it's so important. I feel like you need that stability mm. 
in your life because it's only going to allow you to grow mm -hmm. everywhere else. And we see in society nowadays this huge sort of narrative of, of the lack, you know, stay away from the family, you know, have as many partners as you want and have the fun, for example. Um, and yet it's, it's, very, it's, it's quite unique for you to be, you're, you're quite young, right? You're still quite young, yeah. you're only 24. 24, exactly. So like to be married at 24, let yeah. alone have a child as well. You know, how's that, as you we already talked about how it shaped you, but what are your thoughts when you see this narrative of the other side? The skilled challenge is finally here. Enjoy the lowest profit targets in the industry through our skilled challenge, which is only requiring a 6% profit target. Yes, you heard that right. Not only that, but enjoy 85% profit split as well as a 125% challenge free refund, all part of the best product on the market. You get to choose your drawdown between eight or 10% through our toggle option. So you choose how much drawdown you'd like. Take advantage of the skilled challenge today. Wow, the skilled challenge looks incredible. As part of this special episode, SFT is doing 20% off all 10% virtual drawdown challenges. So make sure you use the code RIZ20 with the link in the description below and start your challenge. Let's get back to the episode. In, in, in like looking at my own life mm -hmm. right now, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit of a different story. I never really expected to get married at 24, mm -hmm. um, but there's been certain life events that have shown me that my wife is the one mm -hmm. that I need in my life. And I actually met her back in 2020. We dated for a little bit, kind of on and off. Mm -hmm. And we stopped talking for about a period of a year. And then we actually started talking again. And like I said, like there's been a few life events that have happened in my life where I feel like anybody else would have just been like, I'm not even going to go anywhere near this guy. Mm. You know what I mean? And she was always there no matter what. And I know like a lot of people online, like, they're very critical about somebody with money and then the person they're with. Mm. But to me, that was never a question because, I mean, my wife, um, she's an influencer. She has a lot of famous people that follow her, to say the least. I mean, athletes worth hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, who are willing to give her everything plus more. And she's always been by my side, never folded, not once. So, and like I said, again, after all of those experiences, going through that with her, she's always been by my side. I knew, like, this was the one that... I need a lockdown. I want to start a family with, mm -hmm. you know, and it was probably one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. Definitely. No, and it's incredible to hear. And, you know, in regards to social media, you know, especially not only in the trading space, but yeah. also generally, it's a very uh, toxic environment. hundred percent. Right? Very 100%. toxic environment. And so what's it like and, and the thought process then of sort of like sharing quite a lot, you know, how, like the family, for example, or even your daughter, for example, what's your thought process around that? I mean, um, I find social media as a, a way to document. Mm -hmm. You know, so like, especially like early on with all of my FTMO videos, seeing like the payouts, the 30,000 payout, the $100,000 payout, you know what I mean? Um, it's nice to look back and see where I was then and compared to where I am now and if there's been any growth along the way. But I mean, with social media, um, I don't really have like an issue with, you know, sharing my personal life. Plus, I feel like people need to understand that like I'm also human too. Mm -hmm. And because I feel like it's a big misconception that a lot of people have. It's like that I'm super unreachable, that uh, I'm like this person that a lot of people like put on a pedestal. But it's like, you know, I also live my life. Like it's the, the only difference is I just work super hard mm -hmm. and I just try and provide the best I can. But uh, I mean, with social media, like especially when it comes to my wife, like that's something that she's always done in the past. I mean, she was a huge YouTuber. So it's not like anything has changed for her. And for me, the only difference now is that I share my family life and I share my relationship. That's really like the only difference. The one thing that I do like dislike mm -hmm. is I, I know you have a bunch of fake pages too, for yeah. sure, right? They use pictures of me and my family on those fake pages yeah, to scam worst. others. That like, that boils my blood when I see it. Cause it's like, what a disgusting type of person you have to be to use pictures of like an innocent little girl who's just born into the world to try and go st literally scam people for their hard-earned money for absolutely no reason. Like, it's just, that that's one thing that does, like, get me mad. But other than that, it's like, I like documenting, you know? Definitely. No, no, and you're completely right, you know, that it's absolutely insane that people would do that. Um, you know, and it just but, generally making fake profiles is terrible. Yeah, but you know what, extent. to be honest, like, I feel like the people that allow themselves to get scammed by these individuals are just simply ignorant. Mm. Because especially in my case, like, 
I say it all the time. Like, this is my only page. And not just that, I'm verified. Mm. You know, so if you see John Wick 32, you know what I'm talking yeah. about with my pictures that mm -hmm. says Lambo Raul on them, mm -hmm. you're going to allow yourself to get scammed by this individual. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of like, I know a lot of people aren't tech savvy, but it's kind of like, I know, yeah. you know. Well, think about it. If you're trying to get into the trading space, but yeah, you're getting caught out like that. You probably shouldn't be in the trading space. Yeah, literally. Yeah. Especially if like, you said John Wick for you. Imagine if it was John Wick for me or John Smith for me. Yeah, 100%. With, with the way I look. <laughs> and they still fall for it. You know, yeah, bro. A hundred percent. Yeah, and like the thing with the trading space, a lot of people try and get in and it's like, I, I, I get asked questions all the time. It's like, you can't expect to be spoon fed everything mm -hmm. in this industry. Like you're entering industries with hedge funds, institutions, big algorithms, other retail traders who've been at this for years, and you expect it to not just be easy, but then to be spoon fed everything, mm -hmm. and you expect to turn like a few hundred dollars into millions of dollars, like people just have the wrong expectations when coming into this community. That's literally what I tell them all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you really want to make it in this industry, like you have to put in the work. Mm -hmm. You can't be ignorant, you know? No, definitely. And, you know, we were talking about the social media side in terms of like the the toxic side and, and people's opinions. Obviously, I'm sure you've had it for a long period of time, probably especially on social media. At the end of the day, like your name on social media is Lambo Raul, and we all know yeah. that the Lambo lifestyle is something that some people aspire towards, but then some people hate upon. Of course. Right, there was a tweet I read this morning, which was interesting timing wise, but they were saying like, they had your pictures. And yeah, there was I some, can imagine. Did you see it? I don't know if you saw it, but it's like- No, I didn't see it. Um, yeah, your pictures, and it was like, this is not what you need. If anyone who's trying to promote this, you know, pictures with Lamborghinis and cars, you shouldn't be less. Look at my page, and then they're referring to themselves, which was interesting. Yeah. But like when you see things like that, or people trying to say like you're a scammer, or people trying to say you're a fake trader. I saw one of your yeah, um, yeah. your highlights where you said yeah. like um, you're faking withdrawals, and then you yeah. afterwards you showed FTMO. Yeah. But like, what are your thoughts when you read all these things or have these people's opinions? So like personally, for me, the only reason I started an Instagram page was because. What I saw Instagram at the time, this was maybe like 2017, was literally just people just posting their cars. I'm a huge car enthusiast, always have been, always will be, and people literally had different names such as like GTR Eddie or mm -hmm. R35 this, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And it's just a page to showcase their cars. And that's literally why I started an Instagram. I had a Mustang at the time and I was literally just posting pictures of my Mustang, right? And then I ended up getting a GTR after making some money you know, and then I changed my name to Raul GTR because why? Because the page is to showcase the GTR, but my name is Raul. Mm. And then one day, this was a few years later after I had my hair account, it's like, bro, why are you Raul GTR on Instagram? Or this was my friend Ryan, he told me, he's like, why are you Raul GTR on Instagram? Like, you don't even post a GTR anymore. And I'm like, you're kind of right. Mm. So that's when I changed it to uh, Lambo Raul because I was mainly showcasing the Huracan. And I never really thought my Instagram page would turn into what it is today. Like I literally just broke 550,000 followers on Instagram, it's crazy. I get like 70,000 story views a day. Mm. It's absolutely uh, insane. I never thought I would get to this point on social media, um, but I was, yeah, I was just posting literally just pictures of my car, appreciating the, especially, uh, essentially the art mm -hmm. of what it is, um, of what this machine is, because some cars are just put together so well, especially with the performance and the looks. And to me, that's always been like one thing that I've always wanted to work hard for is, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Is to have a nice car. And it's not just to like flex or anything on social media for anybody, you know? It's just like, I really appreciate not just the, I don't know if I want to call it the corporation, but you know, um, the people that were able to put that car together, mm -hmm. but then my own hard the work and as well. Yeah. Of course, I mean, there's just so much that goes into building a car such as like the SVJ. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely insane. So, you know, I really get to appreciate both ends of the spectrum, the people that built the car and then my hard work for being able to mm -hmm. obtain this specific individual car. Now, obviously my social media has definitely grown throughout the years. You know, I have my, I have my page where I solely just post education, things that'll benefit people for trading, but Lambo Road, like, that's my personal page. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And a lot of the people that talk about, oh, you know, like, don't follow this, this, and that, it's like, yeah, I can agree to an extent because there are a lot of people who will post the same type of content that I post, but don't know absolutely jack shit about trading, mm -hmm. have never even placed a single trade in their life. And I've had and been friends with some of these individuals where they've admitted to me after showing like a $100,000 day and having a, a, a Lamborghini or a Rolls Royce, they're like, bro, I've never placed a trade in my life. And looked at that individual and I immediately like, bro, I, I completely stopped 
associating myself with them because I don't want to be associated with that. Mm. Because to me, my career, I've put so many hours of work, not just in like content or anything, but in trading that I don't want to be associated to somebody that is literally just faking it so they can make money off of whatever else they want to do. Mm -hmm. Which, if you're not a trader, in my opinion, like, that's fine. There's still money to be made in the trading industry, just not in the educational space mm -hmm. because you have no real value to provide. Like, you can look at Angelo from The Funded Trader, mm -hmm. and he's running a multi-million dollar corporation, and he said trading just wasn't for him. Mm -hmm. So what did he do? He went to business to solve a solution for other traders, mm -hmm. and now he's making millions of dollars because of it. And again, like Angelo is another person that I look up to and I applaud because I remember he came down here to meet with me because um, we were working out some form of a deal where he had this one company that allowed a certain individual to manage a bunch of funded accounts, mm. right? And he presented that opportunity to me and I went with it. I'm like, okay, yeah, perfect. Like, let's do this, right? And after passing like the first, uh, the first and second phase, mm -hmm. I think it was like there, I would have had like 27 million under management or something along those lines. Wow. So I passed like 27 million dollars worth of challenge and, and stage two accounts. The company said, "No, we can't handle this." Mm. You know what I mean? So he, uh, and, we actually and discussed head, this when I had him on the podcast. Huh? Yeah, huh? yeah, we we discussed that situation on the yeah. podcast when I had him on. So it's interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the company was like, "No," and I guess that's what you know he ran with. You know what I mean? And the other people, I just, I decided not to associate myself with them because again, like I've put, I feel a lot of transparency mm -hmm. out when it comes to like, even just my withdrawals. Like as you and I both know, FTMO has been a corporation open for many, many years now. And I was one of the first, if not the first people to get a six figure payout. And at that time, the account, the biggest account size was only $300,000, mm -hmm. you know? So I was able to, in, in total, I had made $170,000 a profit on the account, but then I took some losses and realized 140 grand worth of profits at the end of the 30 days. And with the 70% profit split, I made like $104,000 what my payout was. Mm -hmm. And not just anybody could do that out of luck. Mm -hmm. You know, that takes real skill and that alone should have showed you. Now imagine that was two years ago or three years ago. So I had now have an extra three years of experience from those days. And that wasn't even just like my first payout from FTMO. I had been getting payouts 15, 20, 30, 40, even fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars from FTMO, and again, all of that is I have it all on my website too. Well, it's, interesting it's enough, obviously, as you see. can imagine, we're doing research beforehand to think about what what, what questions or topics to talk about, and yeah, you know, that's why I went through your highlight, for example. And one of my guys actually, where is he? he's over there. Yeah, uh, one of my guys is uh, on Twitter, and they actually, you remember with uh, FTMO, you could post the the stats, yeah. right? So they, he pulled up the stats of the yeah, 100,000 yeah. withdrawals. Website, so yeah. I was looking at it. I could see, obviously, I think you'd done uh, a bit of drawdown, a bit of uh, break even to begin yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. Went up to, I think it was 20, came back to break even. Zero, right? yeah. Back to zero. And then it went up. And then you had like you know, 30K days, followed by like 10K days, uh, lost yeah. days, 30K days. So I saw the whole thing. And um, yeah, so it's there. And, and then you documented it on YouTube as well. Yeah. Um, so like when you see these people, because everyone now, obviously back then the prop space wasn't as big as it is course, now, right? Of course, of course, um, But the prop space now is massive and a lot it's of huge. people put weight into people's payouts. Of course. So then when you hear people say that you're a fake uh, trader or, or faking withdrawals, but yet then you have this documentation from before. Exactly. Like that's because a lot of people can say whatever they want about like trading on an unregulated brokerage. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? With the fake withdrawals and all that other stuff. But I even go as far to the extent as showing the withdrawal. Like, for example, I'm recording a YouTube. I'm in the process of recording a YouTube video right now. So I, I, we had spoke about it previously. On Thursday, I had closed out of a position of $134,000. Mm -hmm. I withdrew $107,500 from the trading account. And on the YouTube video, you literally, even on my Instagram story, I posted it. You literally see me do an internal transfer from the trading account all the way to my wallet. From the wallet inside of the brokerage, the funds actually getting approved for the withdrawal and it then landing into my crypto wallet. So I go that full route of transparency. I can even go as far as showing the bank statement. Here it is on my bank statement, right? But you know what it is? I find like even with all of that transparency, and by the way, those are things you can't do on an account that is essentially fake. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't even show the money hit a wallet inside of the brokerage because yeah. it's all just fake, you know? So I go to those links to show transparency because I've had multiple six figure days and I've done this multiple times mm -hmm. and it's, you could go through my YouTube channel and look at multiple of those YouTube videos and, and see the entire withdrawal process as well. What I've come to the realization is somebody that is doing better than you 
will mo- the majority of the times will never talk bad about you. Mm. So a lot of those people, it's just because they haven't been able to achieve what I've achieved. You know, and I mean, I put myself in a situation, in their situation at least. You know what I mean? Because like I see a lot of those people and they're pulling maybe like four, five, six, seven, ten thousand dollars worth of profit sometimes. A lot of these guys, like they show those types of profits and some of them are older, some of them are younger than me, but a lot of them have like seven, eight years worth of trading under the belt and I'm probably have six years of experience going on to seven now and they still haven't been able to get to where I'm at in terms of maybe social media, Mm -hmm. in terms of maybe the type of income made from trading. You know what I mean? So a lot of it can be seen as either envy or jealousy. To me, it doesn't really bother me. I mean, people are going to have their opinions at the end of the day. Um, I know what I'm doing is fully transparent. And at least what I could say is like the money that I've made from trading, what I've showcased has been always legitimate. And at the end of the day, I mean, it's just more money for me, Mm -hmm. you know, because like I can get a lot of these guys, like I know people who have posted like $150,000 days and I know it's fake for sure. It's like, well, it's fake income. Like that's literally monopoly money. At least like, you know, when I show like a $20,000 day, $30,000 day, it's real. I'm putting that in my pocket. Mm -hmm. Like you're not really going anywhere with it. You're just trying to make other money from probably some course that you're selling or Mm -hmm. whatever the case might be is. So I know that um, everything that I've done has been fully transparent as possible and my community sees it. And not even just that, it's like even the education that I've taught through my community, like I was telling you earlier, I had uh, two students last year. My educational program has only been open for around a year now, a little bit over. It's probably like a year and a half now, but within the first year, we've had two students completely quit their nine to five jobs and become full time day traders. Like my most recent student who did quit his nine to five job and become a full time day trader, he ended up getting a payout for $45,000. And then he ended up making $45,000 in a day and getting paid out. I forgot how many thousands of dollars, but it it was around like the $50,000 range. So he ended up making $90,000 within a span of two months. Um, And that's like a few weeks after completing my entire educational program and obviously being there and putting in all the work. I don't want to say it's like it's super easy. You come, you take this and then you're immediately going to be successful. You know, we both know that that, that's Mm -hmm. not the case. You know, you have to put in the work. Right. And I mean, it just goes to show and I've had tons of students get payouts in the $30,000 range, $15,000 range. And that's the entire thing that I go by is also my students' success as well. You know, the investment that they make into me, they get back plus way more, Mm -hmm. you know, and it just shows. And he quit his nine to five job. What he normally made in a year, he doubled that in the span of 60 days, which is absolutely fantastic. And I'll always applaud him for that because now he's an inspiration to other people who are just getting into the industry as well. Definitely. And what, what is the motivation then, obviously, in terms of that teaching? Let's take a break for a minute there, guys, because I want to tell you about our other sponsor, Trade Zeller. Now, Trade Zeller is something I only wished I had during my journey because I would have saved myself so much time and more importantly, money. Because Trade Zeller is the greatest automated journaling software on the market. That's right. Automate it. All you have to do is connect your MetaTrader 4, MetaTrader 5, and it will pull up all of your data with all your statistics. It goes so in depth from obviously your losses, the days, the times. It allows you to bar replay so you can actually see that trade as if it was live. Absolutely incredible. It's an absolute game changer for everyone's trading journey. Without data, how can you make a statistical edge? I went through so much time without collecting data, without journaling. And why was that? Because most people find journaling very tedious when in reality, why not have it automated and all done for you? All you do is just add the notes. As part of TradeZeller, you also have playbooks. So if you have different entry drills, you can list them all out so you can categorize your trades. TradeZeller is for everyone, whether you trade options, whether you trade Forex, whether you trade prop firms, or even just your own personal account. It is here to revolutionize the trading journey. Make sure you click the link in the description below and use the code RIZ10 for 10% off. Go take a look at the link in the description. Let's get back to the episode. As part of this special episode, Trade Zella has agreed to do 20% off your yearly subscription with the code WOR. Level up your trading experience and more importantly, your trading stats and data. This is your opportunity. 20% off. Link is in the description. Let's get back to the episode. For me right now, teaching is just a way for me to sharpen my edge. And it's just so I'm not doing anything. 
because what I find is after having especially like these super large days, like 100K days, like I don't want to continue to trade. I just want to like live my life. You know, if I want to wake up at two o'clock in the afternoon, then I can wake up at two o'clock in the afternoon. So teaching right now gives me a responsibility and it also keeps me involved in the markets mm -hmm. a lot more. Not just that, to me, teaching is a win-win situation because all of the content and the educational value that I'm providing to these traders, I know I'm guiding them in the right path. Mm -hmm. And even from somebody, you know, looking out, right, they may not know, but I know that, you know, everything that I'm putting out there is going to help somebody reach their goals because obviously me and you both know that there's a bunch of people who teach, who sell courses that don't know what they're talking about, mm -hmm. right? So for me, it's like, I know you're in good hands. Mm -hmm. You know, I trade real capital every single day. I put my money. And that's one thing that aggravates me too. It's like, you know how hard I have to work and how hard it is to hold some of these positions to get those big six-figure days. Mm -hmm. So for me to finally like, and be like, guys, look, this is motivation for you guys. I was able to accomplish this. For someone to go do that and mm -hmm. it be completely fake and get the same recognition, bro, that just like aggravates me. I'm not the guy, I'm not the type of guy to go on social media, yo, this is, this is all fake, this is, this, and this is why, but it's just aggravating, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. it's like, imagine you putting in all of this hard work and some guys doing essentially the same thing, but it's completely fake, you know? Um, so like I was saying before, for me, like, Teaching right now is a win-win situation because I'm able to provide and help other people mm -hmm. while also having a different stream of income for myself that completely takes the pressure off of my own trading. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't even trade every single day anymore. I literally only trade Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday with my community because I don't have the need to trade anymore. Like, I just made 134 grand on Thursday. I don't, I don't need to be getting back into the markets for no reason. Before my trading income, a lot of it went to, some of it paying, went into paying expenses, but a lot of it went into investing into other businesses mm -hmm. and having other investments. And now that I have that, it's just like, I realistically don't need to trade anymore to make money. Mm -hmm. Now what I'm trading for is literally just to have income to set aside to again, go invest into this property. Or maybe, hey, I'm gonna put an extra quarter million dollars into leveled up uh, for our traders, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. you know? So for me, educational right now, education right now is just a win-win situation for both myself and for both my students because I get to help them out and achieve their goals. Definitely. So like, obviously we have the different separations there. So how much, let's say last year, did you make from trading? So I did have a seven figure month in August last year when I was trading the S&P 500. Um, I want to say, I don't want to give like an exact number because mm -hmm. um, like I could talk about income and all this and that a lot, but um, I did make roughly over probably 2.5, probably two before tax, 2.5 mm -hmm. is what I made. And the thing about trading future, I don't trade futures, I trade indices, but um, the way I traded, the way we taxed my income was on a 60-40 split. So 60% of that income was actually taxed in short-term, or sorry, long-term capital gains tax. The other was taxed, the 40% was taxed in uh, short-term capital gains tax. That's how much I made basically trading last year. I didn't trade throughout the summer and then, um, my performance wasn't the best on uh, quarter two either. I did really well in quarter one and quarter four, mm -hmm. and a little bit better on quarter three. And then well, how about income-wise from the education side? Um, I, I, I also did seven figures in education as well. Yeah, that's the one thing uh, I like about the educational space because a lot of people is like, okay, well, if you make so much money trading, like, why do you sell a course? Well, it's like, if I can make 2.5 trading and I can make another 2.5, with education, not just am I only helping people, but I'm able to also increase my income. I've essentially made $5 million in that one year alone by trading and helping other people, mm -hmm. you know, versus just $2.5 million just from trading alone. But I also think having trading as your only stream of income as well is super mm -hmm. unrealistic because you and I both know the pressure that's involved with trading. And I couldn't imagine having trading be my only stream of income because then I have to worry about trading, paying every single one of my bills, mm -hmm. you know? So having other streams of income really takes that pressure off of myself. And I think anybody who's aspiring to be a full-time day trader, you shouldn't quit your nine to five job right away when you start seeing money. You go invest into another business, go invest into a side hustle that'll replace that nine to five income mm -hmm. where you can then quit your nine to five job and move on and so forth. And you have multiple streams of income. I don't know if you heard the saying, but uh, I think the quote is like your average millionaire has seven streams yeah. of income. So why do you only have one to have one, mm -hmm. you know? And on top of that, like when it comes to trading, the market is going to go through different cycles mm -hmm. at all times. How the markets are trading now aren't going to be how the market's going to be trading in six months. So your system could be doing amazing mm -hmm. now, but could be finding a lot of drawdown within the next 
six months and it may take you some time to realize that and then adapt to the new market conditions and you're going to be in drawdown and you're going to be under a lot of stress mm -hmm. that's why i always say like you want to have multiple sources of income anyways definitely definitely and we'll go into the trading now because we haven't really touched on the actual sort of trading part of the journey then from well near the beginning you mentioned obviously when you started you pay 1500 for a course and then 500 into a live yeah. account so what, what was the process after that point what, where, where did you go from there those beginning so, steps I remember my first trade that I placed on my live account, like the course that I took, the risk management was, they didn't teach risk management. They told you this, if you have this amount of money in your account, this is what lot size you should mm -hmm. be using, which yeah. is not risk management. So I thought you had to place like 10 trades in a day, like minimum. Mm -hmm. So I took my first trade and I made like $50. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, this is crazy. Like I'm already up 10% on my account. Like this is crazy. All right, let's go on to the next nine trades, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> complete wrong mindset. But ever since then, it's like every day nonstop, every day nonstop. I watched that course, took another, I took a few courses, read books, YouTube videos, did the whole things. Never really had like a mentor, like what I provide to my community, where I could guide someone in the direction. Um, never had someone answer my questions either. A lot of it, it was just like personal research or through trial and error. Mm -hmm. Um, and I really wish someone told me how important keeping a trading journal was back then, because I feel like I would have found profitability a lot earlier mm. on. That's something I push to my community and even like, just like my YouTube channel, my Telegram, like you need to be able to track your statistics because in your statistics, you'll be able to see the bad habits that are causing you from potentially being profitable or potentially getting you out of that break even phase or potentially even getting you to that break even mm -hmm. phase. You'll find a lot of that. And I feel like a lot of people are focused on really doing right as much as possible, but they're not focused on removing and eliminating making mistakes. They're like, how can I increase my win rate? It's like, okay, well, you know, I could find better entries. I could maybe use lower stop losses, blah, 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 this and that. But it's not like, how can I stop taking so many losses? Mm -hmm. You know? So I didn't realize that early on in my trading journey. So I feel like my trading journey was a little bit more difficult because I didn't even know where risk management was because I was obviously going from the risk management mm -hmm. from that course. So a lot of it was just kind of like gambling and over leveraging. Um, and honestly, my trading journey really came down to a lot, a lot, a lot of trial and error and experience. I mean, I showed up to the charts every single day. At that point in time, because I was sick so many days, the school decided to just, you know what, like, they literally said, you're not even in school, right? You're literally in the hospital the majority of the time. We think it's best that like, you go and get into online school. So I went into online school, and I didn't have any friends either at the time. And I literally dedicated all of my time. When I tell you all of my time, like, I was playing Counter-Strike on my free time, <laughs> and, I was, um, and I was trading and studying. Mother free time. I, 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 I did think I burnt myself out a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I was probably on the charts, studying, taking the course, and actively trading maybe like six to eight hours a day. Wow. Every single day for like the first like three years. Mm -hmm. For the first three years. And it was a lot of trial and error, and it was a, a really difficult journey. It was a really difficult journey, I'll tell you that for sure. Definitely, and in terms of like the, the journey then from with the trading the scaling because obviously you're getting to the point now where you're talking about six figure days and seven figure yeah. months but what was the scaling like because you started with five hundred dollars so Correct. what was that process from there so the five hundred dollars i mean i immediately blew it mm -hmm. at that time i was helping my dad with his business i was an employee at his business i was selling products and making commission for selling those products mm -hmm. so that's how i was making my income at that time and i would invest like every dollar that i had into a trading account and I remember there was this one time where I actually had like maybe like 30 grand to my name and I put $20,000 into a trading account and those $20,000 I turned into like $120,000 in like three weeks. Obviously over leveraging and over risking, I don't want you, anybody watching this to think that that's like something that's sustainable and they should achieve for. Mm -hmm. um, so then my scaling and my profitability was a little bit different because what I realized was although I was consistently getting income from trading, I was also blowing accounts at the same time. So to give you the example, the way I found that I was consistently profitable was I would turn 20,000 into 120,000, right? I withdrew like 50 grand. So I made my $20,000 back plus an extra $30,000, mm -hmm. but then I would blow that account. Okay. Then I'd be like, oh my God, great. You know what? Let's just go in with 10 grand this time. $10,000, I would turn $10,000 into $30,000. Withdraw 20, I left 10 in there because it's like, okay, this $10,000 is purely profit. Mm -hmm. I pulled out my 10 and I pulled out an extra 10 of profit. I would maybe, 
I remember with that specific account, that $10,000 account, I ran it back up into like $40,000. I withdrew 20. So that's like the first account that I have for like, okay, you know, this account's lasted like two months already, mm -hmm. but then I blew it right away. And it's like, why do I keep blowing these accounts? And you know what my problem was? It was one day. I would fuck it all up in one day because I would try to overtrade. Mm -hmm. And what I would find in, this, in my overtrading, I'm just trying to make those losses back. So at that point in time, it's like, okay, I need to take a break for a second. I need to analyze what I'm doing wrong. And that time I actually started getting into journaling because I found like how crucial journaling was. And that's where I realized that mistake. I was giving all of that back in a span of a day, mm. literally weeks upon weeks of hard work, being as patient as I possibly can, waiting for my setups to play out. I was giving it all back in one day. Now, obviously like, thank God I was actually withdrawing because that's a big problem that a lot of people do. Uh, don't do is they do not withdraw they don't pay themselves thank god i was actually withdrawing that's what kept me mm -hmm. in the game right so from there at that point on once i realized that mistake it was a it was a lot smoother of a road i actually went in with basically like all the money that i had at that time which was maybe like 50 grand mm. and that's when i started to find profitability with a fifty thousand dollar account and then shortly after i mean i was able to pay my bills um that i had my, my little bills that i had you know had my car at that time, my phone bill, little things like that, such as uh, along those lines. Then I had a big breakthrough. I had a $30,000 trading day. This was trading USD JPY. I forgot what type of economic data came out at that point in time, um, but the markets absolutely died. The markets absolutely died. And uh, I made $30,000 in that day, and it was just from there, it was literally just a nice smooth way up. And then after that, that's kind of when I started getting into the educational space. Mm -hmm. I started showcasing profits online and doing little things such as that, uh, such as those things. Cause in my trading career, like I said, I wanted my Instagram page to document. I would show my trades like, you know, a thousand dollars here, $2,000 mm. there. You know what I mean? At the end of the month, I would make maybe like $30,000, but I never made like $30,000 in the span of a day. Mm. And once I did that, I knew it was, it was a lot of my hard work was actually finally starting to pay off. Definitely. So first of all, like the 50 K for example, sorry, no, the 20 uh, K. So you saved up 30, put 20 in flipped it to 120. Mm -hmm. Before you had put the 20 in though, had you sort of been trial and error? You've been- Oh yeah, I've been training this entire time. Mm -hmm. I've been training this entire time. This was like nonstop. Okay, so then this you've seen some sort of confidence to then say, okay, now I've saved this amount. I'm yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Like I was trading like super small accounts, like $1,000, $2,000, just to build up some consistency. Mm -hmm. Once I found that consistency, it's like, okay, let's go in a little bit heavier. Then I, if I like, let's say I had an $1,000 account, I remember. I was able to successfully maintain that account for the span of like 60 days. It's like, okay, I'm gonna put five grand in. Okay. Then I had a $6,000 account. I wasn't really paying too much attention to the profits because I had blown like four or five like thousand dollar accounts. I was like, damn, bro, that's like five grand that I just lost, mm. right? And that's what people also need to be careful with. Like, it's like, if you're constantly investing like a thousand dollars and you're just blowing them and blowing them and blowing them, although that account might not be a lot, I mean, those, co those losses compound fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. That's what a lot of people need to be careful with. And that's basically how I would just continue to go into the market. So as I was be more consistent, I would continue to fund my account, mm -hmm. which I feel like a lot of people don't do. Like, I feel like a lot of people don't realize that like trading is an investment mm -hmm. that you can make for either long term, long term or short term. And even if you do have a nine to five job and you have a trading account, it doesn't matter what size account you have, you actively want to be investing into that account until you have a good amount of cushion mm -hmm. in the account where your account could survive the drawdowns of your trading system. Yes. So then, when you got to the point where you had the 50K account and this, you, you use that from there, mm -hmm. was there a case where you were still sort of using over leveraging or were you? I cut down, down on the, the over leveraging a lot because I, I realized, I mean, after like a year, I realized this is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Like there's no way I'm going to be able to be having a $50,000 account risking like $10,000 a trade. It's, mm -hmm. it's just not sustainable. This risk management system I was taught didn't work. So that's when I started to realize, okay, like let's actually start risking normal amounts of money. $50,000, how much do I not care about losing on a single trade? You know what? If I lose $2,000 on this trade, it's not the end of the world. I still have $48,000 in my account. If I lose maybe 10 of those trades in a row, I know I'm in trouble. So what if I lose five trades in a row of those two grand and then I cut the risk even more? Mm. You know, that's when I really started to think. My brain really was started to activate that allowed there. you to then do that? Yep. Yeah. Have you, journaling wise, how would, what was your process for journaling? So journaling then, um, I would be taking screenshots of the positions before and after, mm -hmm. obviously, and then I would basically break down the entire reason as to why I'm taking this trade. Mm -hmm. And obviously my journaling has gotten better throughout the years as better journaling softwares came out. Um, and I would really try and find 
the well at that time i didn't know you know these terminologies like really try and exploit the edge mm -hmm. in the markets and really made sure that the trade had a high probability of winning in my direction like it's just so many different things that you pick up along the years mm -hmm. like understanding what risk reward is risk management understanding probabilities having an edge in market does your system have an edge in the market you know different things along those lines definitely definitely and, and then where did the prop firm side comes in ftmo wise yeah so like i said like i've already been uh, once I got into like the prop firm space, I had already been profitable. I was making a good amount of money from trading. I was I was probably pulling in maybe like 30,000, 40,000 on a really good month mm -hmm. trading, you know, on the low end, obviously it could have been a losing month or even a break even month. Um, so the reason why I even got into prop firms was to just establish my legitimacy mm -hmm. as a trader, mm -hmm. obviously, because I was kind of coming up on the social media space, which I didn't realize it as being a social media space. I just saw it as, you know, again, like somewhere where I could document and showcase my hard work, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I feel like maybe that could have just been like a little bit of a immature mindset of mine because I didn't really think about turning it into a business mm -hmm. then, you know? Um, so again, I went to the FTMO space to verify my legitimacy because if I'm showing these profits now and I go into a funded account where essentially you have a 5% maximum daily loss and a 10% maximum loss, you know, if I can show people that I'm also getting paid out here, like there's, there's no questioning it, mm -hmm. you know, the track record is there, you know, so that's kind of when I got into the FTMO space and I also thought it was a good way for individuals who maybe didn't have as much capital to their name but had the skill to be able to make more money so again it was another win-win situation for myself not only am i able to verify my legitimacy as a day trader someone who actually makes money from day trading mm -hmm. but i'm also able to show people that hey you know like this is a thing mm -hmm. like you guys can come on and take this challenge and make money potentially right so that's kind of when the the whole ftmo um era started for me personally and it went great for my first challenge. I didn't really understand the rules too much. I ended up losing that first challenge, which was nothing crazy. It was a $600 loss for myself. But then my second challenge, I ended up making like $15,000, mm -hmm. which covered the cost of my first challenge plus that challenge because I got all that money back mm -hmm. plus more. You know what I mean? But it's, it, you know, it's kind of unfortunate because FTMO had grown so much since then. I mean, now they offer $400,000. Um, and at that time, they only had 300K with a 70% mm -hmm. profit split. You know, so I feel like I could have definitely made a lot more if uh, the rules that are there now were there then. Definitely, uh, definitely. And you know, what was the, was there a change in thought process compared to trading your personal then going to the prop? Honestly, it felt like less pressure mm. to me because it wasn't my money. Like, it's like, okay, even if I lose like this challenge five times in a row, let's call it 10 times in a row and I lose six grand. If I get a payoff for $30,000, that just covered all of my costs plus profit, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So luckily I never got to that point where I was losing thousands upon thousands of dollars in challenges. Like I know a lot of individuals struggle with, but that's just because they have the wrong mindset in the markets. Like you can't just go and take a challenge, not being profitable, expecting to make a ton of money. This is what you I was gonna what say, I mean? yeah. Like that's absolutely ridiculous, mm -hmm. right? Cause you had so, the profitability first and then came to Of course, of course, right? That's why I never lost thousands upon thousands of dollars on these challenges. Like. The way, if I would have, God forbid, I had to completely restart again. Mm -hmm. The very first thing that I would do, well, I mean, it's, it's different because I, I already know how to trade. I make money trading. But say I didn't, right? I would fund my own trading account and literally just look for consistent profitability. Even if it's a $1,000 account, I'm only looking to make 10% a month. If I could do that successfully for 90 days or even 60 days if I want to cut it short, then that's when I would go and invest into a challenge account and try and get a reasonable size that wouldn't mess with my trading psychology. Mm -hmm. You know, because you can't just expect to go from trading $1,000 to now trading $400,000. Mm -hmm. Super unrealistic also, right? There's a huge shift in P&L and there has to be a huge shift in mindset, right? So whatever the case might be is, let's just say I get a 200K account and I make 10%, mm -hmm. call it the company gives you 90%, so you keep roughly $18,000. Right, if you keep those $18,000, I would invest probably 80% of those profits back into my own trading account mm -hmm. and then pocket the rest and literally just continue to trade my own capital, continue to trade that funded capital and refunnel the money that you make from that prop firm into your own personal account until you have a substantial amount of money where it's like, hey, you know what? I have 100 grand in this trading account. My monthly expenses are only literally 5% 
of whatever my trading account is. If I can make 10% a month, that is more than sustainable because I could allow 5% to continue to compound while withdrawing 5% to cover my expenses, mm -hmm. essentially. Like, I don't think a funded account should be the end-all, be-all for a trader. Mm -hmm. I think it should be what gets them their capital that they need to start their own trading account. Mm -hmm. Definitely. No, I couldn't agree more. And in regards to then the uh, coming off the prop sense, so that's the process you followed, right? Yeah. And in terms of your trading now, um, is what sort of risk are you using per trade? What sort of uh, you know sort of risk to reward model? Are yeah. These sort of things you're using. So right now, like I've actually went from because if you look at the the FTMO track record that you're looking at, where that was the last time I ever bought a, uh, a challenge account, mm -hmm. I had made. Um, Forty thousand dollars the month prior on FTMO, and then the month after is where I had gotten that hundred thousand dollar payout, mm -hmm. right? And that was the last time I ever traded funded. So then I was trading a longer term time frame, and I was trading gold. Now I'm trading shorter term time frames, and I'm trading indices, mm -hmm. right? So my risk to rewards are a little bit shorter, but my win rate is in the seventy percent. Okay, you know. And right now, what I'm really focused on is understanding when to put big money behind certain positions and when to take money off of the table, literally like risk on, risk off, and really finding those high probability setups so I can go, okay, you know what? I'm gonna put $30,000, $40,000 behind this trade. Hopefully, you know, try and aim for a two to one risk to reward ratio. If I get more than that, fantastic. You know what I mean? Like the 100K days I don't plan for anymore, which my problem that I had in August when I had a seven figure month was that I was always, you know what, I made 100K today, I'm gonna try and do the same thing again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I got lucky because I was able to do that successfully like seven out of eight times and it played out in my favor. But after I realized like, hey, you know, I made a million dollars last month, let's try and do it again this month, I lost a quarter million dollars off of the bat. And that was like, and I lost a quarter million dollars in like two or three days. And that was like, a, that's the most money I had ever lost trading. And I was like, okay, let's chill. Let's, you know what, you know, let's just relax here. Right, let's lower the risk, let's build the confidence back up, and then you know what, we'll see what we do. You know, so nowadays, what I'm really trying to understand uh, about myself and my own trading, especially with my system, because I'm a big supply and demand trader, is mm -hmm. what positions I want to put big risk behind and what positions obviously I want to take risk off of the table. In terms of like a, a percentage based risk, I mean, there'll be some trades where I risk one to two percent, there'll be other trades where I'll put like five, six, seven percent behind that specific position. Mm -hmm. You know, are you able to do that due to the win rate? You know, and understanding the stats. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. That gives me all the more confidence because my win rate is so high right now is because I've eliminated trading every single day. Mm -hmm. I don't focus on trading every single day. I focus on trading when there's good opportunity mm -hmm. that aligns with my trading system. Definitely. That's why my win rate is so high right now. Definitely. And in terms of like your routine, then when you are on those trading. Uh, what, are you trading an entire session, entire day, or is there specific Not times? Even. Like, if I don't get a setup before 11 a.m., I most likely won't even take it. Mm. Because the market open is at 9.30, that's when you'll find the most volatility, and you have lunchtime around like 12 o'clock, so volume will slow down and then pick back up in the afternoon. If I don't take a position in those first few hours, I'm walking away. So you're just getting it's very not specific. Worth it. Yes. Definitely. It's, it's non-negotiable for me. Definitely, and so moving on from that then, uh, you talked about other businesses. What other things are you working on as well? So, I mean, I have a few educational platforms. Um, so I have a few streams of income from the educational platform. I also have leveled up um, as well. And then I have a little, a couple of little side jobs. Like I invested into a detailing company. Um, I mean, I have crypto investments as well. Um, but in terms of like other businesses, there's a few other businesses that I do want to get into at some point, such as real estate. I made a lot of money. Mm. actually last year on real estate through my primary home so i bought my first property i forgot when this was back probably like in 2021 during covid mm -hmm. for 830,000 and i sold that same property for about a million dollars i 1031 exchanged it into a property worth 1.4 million dollars this is all documented on youtube mm -hmm. this is all public record obviously as well because again like there's a lot of traders online that say like hey I just bought this $2 million property, mm -hmm. but I know people that live in that same community and that house is a rental for $6,000. Mm. And then they got exposed for saying that, hey, I just bought this $2 million property, for, for but you're renting it? Mm -hmm. And it's a $15,000 rental? Oh, I'm, guys, I'm paying 15 grand to, to rent here, but it's a, it, in reality, it's a $6,000 rental. So like th that's ridiculous that you would even mention you bought a property. Like Why not just be honest, transparent with your community? Mm -hmm. Again, it's all public record. You guys go 
look at the properties and see that I actually bought this property for this price, sold it for this price. And then I 1031 exchanged it into one other property that I bought for 1.4 million and then I ended up renovating that property and I resold that property for $2 million. Mm -hmm. Did that kind of like spark the- Oh my, yes. I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. Because I think I put down um, 20% on the first property, which was roughly $160,000 excluding the closing costs. So mm -hmm. I was maybe all in like 200K on that first property. And I mean, imagine I got my $200,000 back plus all of that extra profit all of that extra equity. And then on top of that, for my second house as well, which was absolutely huge and actually ended up cashing out on that house. That was one mistake that I feel like I made because I could have just 1031 exchanged it into another property, not pay any capital gains tax mm -hmm. on the profit that I made on that one property, you know? So now that I'm sitting on a lot of cash after I buy the property for my family, because like, again, my family needs a home, which I'm actually, working on two real estate deals right now for my primary residence. One property is valued at 2.95 million. The other property is valued at 4.8 million. And I'm looking to get into that property. And I, I really wish I could have 1031 exchanged into there, but you, you only have six months to 1031 mm -hmm. exchange um, into another property. After that, I'm going hard. I'm going hard with real estate. I really want to have multiple different assets under my name, but I have, I have a few different assets. I mean, like even with like my SVJ, you know, that car is worth, a million dollars and I think I have like six hundred thousand dollars in equity in that car alone so if I ever want to sell it I'm gonna get six hundred thousand dollars back from it um, same thing with my watch you know the watch is an asset that I could take off right now go to the guy I bought it from and I can get three hundred thousand dollars easy like this mm -hmm. you know so it's just having different assets and being diversified and not having all of your money sitting in a checking account not doing anything for you you know it's the same thing as the FTX situation mm. if your money is in a bank it's not yours Versus if I have money in a property, that property is mine. You know, that's a piece of land that I own. Mm -hmm. There's that financial literacy, which kind of leads me on to my next question, which was, you know, at that time you'd saved up 30,000, for example. How important was it? Was it always a case you were financially literate or was it a case in terms of like saving? It grew with time. It grew, it, 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 it grew with time. I would definitely tell you that. I wouldn't say I was like the most financially responsible person, especially coming into a lot of money at like at 20 years old. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, but it, it, it definitely grew time. And again, now having a family, I'm, I'm a lot more responsible. Like I was saying last year too, like I was blowing tens of thousands of dollars. I remember looking at my Amex bill for the year and I mean, I mean just going out and clubbing and um, hanging out with uh, friends and drinking and partying. I spent way over half a million dollars looking at my uh, American Express statement, mm. you know? So to me nowadays, having a family and looking for more stability, be more responsible, it's like, you know how many properties I could have bought with half a million dollars? Mm -hmm. Not even, you know the type of property I could have bought with half a million dollars? I could have almost bought, again, this $2.95 million property because the closing costs and everything, I'm looking at $600,000, you know, to get into that property. So it's just like a whole mindset mm. shift because of my family. And I, I again, like I really thank my wife um, for being there for me alongside the entire way and really putting me uh, on a straight road again. Definitely, that's no, incredible to hear. Yeah. And it did lead me into the real estate side. Like, is that something then you're looking to educate? Obviously, you obviously are quite apt to, uh, or you already have a level of knowledge. But is it something then that you're researching and learning about more? Uh, always, always. I mean, I have a lot of people who are into real estate as well. Mm -hmm. um, I also have my real estate agent who obviously, I mean, he's going to make a commission out of everything that I do in real estate. But uh, he's always guiding me in the best direction. So I'll give you an example. Like this property that I'm looking at right now for 295 we don't think it's going to appraise for 2.95. We think it's going to appraise for 2.7. And he's basically letting me know, like, this is not something that you don't want to get into because you could be getting in at this property at the height of the market. Mm. And that property was valued at previously 3.3 million and he lowered it to 2.95, but he doesn't want to accept an appraisal contingency. So the bank will only finance you up to what the appraisal comes out to be. So if the appraisal comes out to 2.7, I have to put down 20% of that 2.7 million on top of covering the difference mm -hmm. from what the seller wants to the appraisal. So it's like, is this really a property you wanna get into? Because you're looking at getting in for a million dollars when for you, we can negotiate the property for 4.8, say they get it for 4.2, you're gonna, it's gonna cost you roughly the same down payment. The only difference is your mortgage and principal, uh, your principal and interest is gonna be a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, just weigh out your pros and cons and see what you wanna do. So I'm looking at my pros and cons right now and we're really trying to negotiate uh, a deal with the more expensive property because in the long run it'll hold way more value than the property that's uh, a little bit cheaper 
Definitely. So in essence, coming from a trading background, do you treat real estate deals or even the cars or even the watches that these investments, do you look at it from an analysis point of view, like risk to reward and, and, and 100%. Risk I look at it, I look at a lot of things as risk to reward. Um, I mean, e like certain things such as my watch, mm -hmm. right? So this watch cost me $325,000. Wow. I had the same exact watch a year ago and a year ago I bought it for $450,000, right? So I ended up selling that watch and taking a $25,000 loss and I sold a lot of my watches and got a lot of my money back and I sat on cash for a while and then the watch prices finally dropped and that's when I started to rebuy back in again because I believe the retail for this watch was 290,000 and I bought it almost close to retail and this is a limited um, piece but it's not just the watch itself that is an investment it's also the conversations mm. that the watch starts the amount of people that I've met at these high-end places such as these expensive restaurants or different gatherings it's like oh hey nice watch it's a great conversation start hey nice watch what do you do for a living you know then we get into the whole con uh we we get into the whole conversation and possible opportunity can come from that i know iman godsey said you know even if you have what was it uh thirty thousand dollars to your name you should be able to spend ten thousand dollars on a watch because of what it possibly could do for you and I, I, you've experienced that already yourself 100 percent. is the same with the cars as well Oh my, yeah, it's just different clubs. Mm. I mean, you don't see many SVJs to begin with, and the fact that I have, in, I mean, I have very nice cars, I'm very blessed to be in the position that I'm in, but it's just like the conversation starters with the cars also. It's just like why Andrew Tate bought a Bugatti, because he got into the Bugatti club, not because he wanted mm. a Bugatti, and it's very similar with the SVJ. Like, you're not gonna see a million dollar car rolling around the street on average. You know, so whenever I do go to a nice restaurant, there's other people there, right? It's a great conversation starter. Again, oh, hey, you know, it's a beautiful car, absolutely love it. What do you do for a living? You know, and that's when the conversation starts. Like, oh, you know, like, you know, I can have a, a few business partners. I'd like you to meet this, this, and that. And you just build your network. And again, like your network is your net worth. Definitely. And, and was it something you were aware of beforehand? Like when you were beforehand, coming no. up? No. No. Beforehand, no. no. Again, like beforehand, it was just like, I, I love cars. I'm passionate about mm -hmm. cars. Talking yeah. about the passion, I was going to ask you actually. What, what? Can you tell me about this? I'm not really into cars at all. I'm, I'm not into cars or watches or anything. I'm, I'm very uh, naive to it all. So, yeah. that, but what, what is this that we have right next to us? So this was an, uh, this was an exhaust from a Lamborghini STO mm -hmm. that uh, I had. I've had a few of those, and again, like I ended up buying an STO. I've had three STOs entirely. I bought my last STO for three hundred and seventy-five thousand. Sold it for a hundred thousand dollars part for four seventy-five. Wow. So again, like. If you have the right connections and the right relationships, you're only gonna be able to get deals like that because not many people can get deals, especially in today's market, mm -hmm. at a car for sticker price, mm -hmm. you know? And it's just like the new Lamborghini Revolto coming in. It's the replacement for the Aventador. It's a new hybrid model. It's gonna be a V12 hybrid. Um, so Lamborghini is no longer gonna be making naturally aspirated cars anymore. And I now have a one of 800 naturally aspirated limited edition V12. So just like in anything, when there's a low uh, supply and a high demand, the value is going to increase, mm. you know? So again, like the, uh, the SVJ to me is an investment. And when the Revolto gets here, there's going to be such a hype and such a demand for that car that it's going to sell way over sticker, just like the SF90. I bought my SF90 at a super low price, right? At like $680,000. Mm -hmm. But the previous owner paid $950,000 for that same exact car the same one i have in my driveway mm -hmm. right but imagine the guy before him he bought it at sticker price mm -hmm. sold it to the other guy for 950 he took the depreciation hit and i bought it for almost 700 grand so so how do you then go about when it is got a higher a higher demand and a higher asking price and then you're getting offers no doubt how do you do you get your enjoyment out of it or do you, do you think okay this is a good time to sell um i did sell my last svj for it and it was probably one of the best decisions i made because the SVJ market, I bought my first SVJ. It was again a, a, a Roadster, which are the more limited ones, for 620,000, I believe. And I ended up selling it for 800 grand. And I basically rolled all of that equity over into my new SVJ because it was a more limited model. Like my SVJ has a factory matte blue paint, mm. um, with a paint job, which is a $20,000 paint job. And there's only two in the United States, mine and some other guys. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's, um, and it's a Roadster. So I saw this is a brand new car, 2021. Mine was a 2019 at the time, mm -hmm. or, or 2020. This is a brand new car. It has 800 miles, and it's a limited paint. I'm gonna roll my 
current money over into this car because this car is going to be more valuable in the long run than my current car, which I'm very glad that I did because my old car is actually for sale. Mm -hmm. The previous owner sold it, and it's for sale right now for maybe $700,000. So I was able to cash out on my previous SVJ, rolled everything over into this SVJ, and now have positive equity plus the profit from the last mm -hmm. SVJ versus just holding that asset. So I try not to get too attached to the cars because when a good opportunity comes up, it may be best to get rid of it. But again, it came down to the analysis at the end of the day is what mm. saved me. No, definitely. And it sounds, it's very interesting actually because as someone again who doesn't really have that knowledge and I don't think a lot of people probably have the knowledge of getting to that level. Because I was actually speaking to Q because uh, he did a tweet about uh, entry level supercars. We yeah. get a lot, of, uh, a lot of backlash from people. But yeah. uh, what we kind of summarized was the fact that you know, most people just see Lamborghini, they just see Ferrari, they know the yeah. names. But then, as you said as well, like you weren't aware of these levels and these different levels that come with it, limited edition and so on. Of course. Until you're of at course. that level. Of course. Right? So then people would assume that, why do you need all these cars and they depreciate in value, you're wasting money. Well, Not at all. As you've just broken just down, ignorance. it's the opposite. Again, it's just, it's, just, it's just people talking about something they have no idea mm. about. You know what I mean? But, you know, I kind of do agree with the with Q's statement, because just like to anything, there's an entry level. Mm. Just like with Richard Mille, there's an entry level. What's the entry level? An RM10. You get it for 100 grand versus getting a Richard Mille for $300,000. Mm. Same thing with supercars. You know, you want to be an entry level supercar guy, there's absolutely no problem with it. But again, it's just different conversation starters. Mm. If you have an SVJ parked right next to a Huracan Evo, which is essentially is the entry level for Lamborghini, everyone's going to run over to the SVJ. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, SVJ, one of 800. Again, and you have the higher guys, people that have been on these cars, higher net worth individuals, they're gonna appreciate the SVJ more because somebody who not just buys the SVJ knows that they have the money to buy the SVJ, but they understand that this SVJ in specific is an asset compared to your Lamborghini Huracan Evo. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's very so, interesting. Yeah. yeah. This, is, this is why I love the podcast though, because I learn so much and uh, I would be one of those ignorant people, especially a while, not, not even a while ago, to be fair, probably a year ago. But thanks to the podcast, I've been able to be educated as well. And that's why I love it so much. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to go back to something. It's a bit going back to the, almost the beginning. You mentioned yeah. obviously going through the health complications during uh, high school, right? Yeah. And as you said, you spent a lot of time alone and a lot of people, and there's a lot of young traders out there who, who watch the show as well. And, you know, going through those difficult times in high school and, and when you're at a young age, you're not, not being able to live the normal life or be able to party or be able to, you know, maybe even have friends, as you said. How did you handle that? You know, did, how, what was that experience like? Um, to me, I mean, I had my little acquaintances uh, at that time. We would kind of hang out here and there, but I spent the majority of my time literally, like, locked inside. So my mom had a pantry at her house. She lives in the same house. And... I turned that into like my little sanctuary, my little office, right? And it was like literally like, you, you, I fit my entire office in the little couch over there mm -hmm. basically. That it was, the space was very small, right? I spent all of my time in there literally studying, trading. And when I wasn't doing that and I felt burnt out and I, I needed a break, because you need a break at times. You know, I would literally just be playing Counter-Strike. That was my life, mm -hmm. that was literally my life. And uh, in terms of like the mindset side of things, because I'm no doubt you probably wanted to do what the, the normal average uh, your kid was doing or school, high school kid was doing, but not being able to, how did you handle the mindset side of things as well? It was, um, it was, it is what it is. You know what? God put me on this path for a reason. You know what I mean? And I know for sure if I did join the military, I would not be where I'm at today. So I have to thank him for, and th thank him and thank myself for trusting in him. Mm for putting me on this specific path, you know what I mean? I, I didn't really experience problem or, or go out and party uh, all too much, but that's 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 perfectly fine, Yeah. you know what I mean? Because a lot of those people probably wish they were in the position that I was today, or that I am in mm -hmm. today, you know? And uh, I honestly enjoyed, I honestly enjoyed my life back then too, you know? Definitely. It's not like that uh, I had mm -hmm. any regrets, it's just the health issues did suck because once a month I would have to go and get, um, this one medication called Remicade, which was an IV. And oh my God, the pills. I hated the pills. I had to take like seven or eight pills every single day, anti-inflammatory, steroids, antibiotics. It was horrible. But I'll never forget, like the worst part was the, uh, definitely the, uh, the Remicade, which was an IV infusion I had to do every single month. And it completely kills your immune system. So I was always getting sick. Mm. Until one day I was like, you know what? I'm sick of this shit. I'm sick of this shit. I'm done with it. And ever since then, honestly, like, 
I've never looked back. And I feel greater than I ever have. Mm. And, you know, going, I think one thing we can reflect on is that that negative almost is kind of what allowed you to be so focused on the trading during that 100%. time. Then. So then if it, wasn't fa- if it wasn't for that, you might not be where you are today. 100%. And again, like, I thank God for everything he's done. Because obviously when I'm in pain, I'm like, why? Why me? You know what I mean? Like, I don't even do anything to begin with. Mm-hmm. You know, I just stay home and I play video games. You know what I mean? And I, again, like, I literally have to thank him for putting me in the position that I'm at today because I don't even know if I would have gotten sick if I'd be here today. Definitely. And then when you see a lot of traders nowadays, as you can imagine, the, the space has changed so much over the yeah, years. Every huge. year it's, it's just growing and growing and growing. And COVID probably, I think, put it onto steroids itself. Like, yeah, for it sure. It just exploded. I remember being at the summit, speaking to so many people. The, I started during COVID. I exactly, during yeah. COVID. The yeah. majority of people just started in COVID and it's crazy. And um, so when you've observed the space and how it's grown in this way, and you, is there trends that you recognize within traders? Uh, I've recognized that a lot of traders aren't, as you said, like you were committed every single day. Yeah. And I see the complete opposite nowadays. Oh, yeah, I see it all the time. I see it all the time. I mean, there's different trends that you see within certain like groups mm. of people, and you can kind of get a grasp if someone's really going to get there or not. Mm-hmm. You know? What would be your advice to those traders that are wanting to get there? You know, what changes can they make? I mean, just get ready to enter one of the hardest industries you possibly can. It's not easy. It's not a get-rich-quick scheme. And you have to literally give it every single ounce of your blood, sweat, and tears if you really want to be successful. Because there's different types of success. And depending on the individual, you know, that's up to them what they determine success actually is. Mm -hmm. But if you want to get to a level where you're literally making hundreds of thousands of dollars on a trade, you have to put every ounce of energy that you have into into being successful in this niche. The way I would look at it is, again, like, look at it as getting a regular college degree. Don't think you're going to be successful in two years. Don't set expectations. Don't set time on yourself when you should be successful, right? Look at it from a five-year standpoint. Because what kept me going, honestly, was I would always tell myself the only traders that fail are the ones that quit, Mm -hmm. right? So if I stayed in the industry for the next five years and I give it everything I have, I'd be way better off where I was Mm -hmm. a year ago. Because you could lose money consistently for the first four years. But maybe on that fourth year, six months in, you find consistent profitability and within the next few months, you make all of those losses back plus way more. Mm -hmm. And again, like trading is a skill set that once you understand it, because you can never master it, Mm -hmm. once you understand it and you know how to maneuver around trading and the trading psychology, and the different ways in the markets, there's really no cap on your income. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand, like, trading income also, for those of you guys that are watching, is not something that's always guaranteed. That's okay. And you have to accept that. There could be months where you lose money. There could be months where you break even. There could be months where you make a little bit of money. There could be months where you make tons of money, right? So you also have to accept that uh, as well. And then again, like, the most important thing is not being in a position where you're just trying to make a lot of money quickly. Because if you do that, you're just going to lose a lot of money quickly. And I would definitely say, last but not least, the only way you're going to get better at trading is by understanding and tracking your own performance. And that's literally what's going to excel you. If you could journal your trades and invest into a trading journal software to read your own performance, avoid making the same mistakes, because journaling is only going to allow you to pick up on those bad habits, to pick up on what mistakes Mm -hmm. you're making. By doing that and avoiding that, you're able to make tweaks to your system on either entries, stop loss methods, take profit methods, or even just your system in general, you're gonna be able to excel a lot faster than what you think you're going to be able to accomplish. Definitely, definitely, and I think that's solid advice. Hopefully people uh, take it on board and, and put it to action. And in regards to you know, people trying to get funded then, you know, and tackle the challenges, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a big thing right now. Huge. Uh, and probably only going to grow even more, but a lot of people struggling. As you said, a lot of people, unfortunately, spending thousands upon thousands yeah. trying to do it. What would be your top three tips for them? First, you need to be in a position where you already know how to trade and you can already make money or at least a pretty consistent return on your investment every single month. Because again, like depending on the company that you're trading with, doesn't matter if it's with us at Leveled Up or at FTMO, you have a time period. Take your time. You know what I mean? After you're already making money, just take your time with passing the challenge, the verification. You know, I don't know how many companies offer no trading days. Mm -hmm. Um, I know we offer no trading days. So 
that's pretty easy. But honestly, it really just comes down to already knowing how to trade. If you don't know how to trade, if you're not already good at trading, if you don't make money trading, don't even think about taking a funded challenge. Mm. But if you are, then again, just focus on the risk management and don't look at a funded account as like your end all be all because it's not mm -hmm. right. Look at your funded account as a way to actively invest into your own personal trading account. No, definitely. And you know, there's a lot of um, people saying nowadays there's a little tone in the market of like, oh, trading could go away. Right. I don't know if you've seen anything like this or heard anything like this. But what um, are your yeah, thoughts yeah. on that? Trading has been around since I probably the beginning of time, mm. you know, people trade their time for money. People trade cows for chickens, mm -hmm. you know, gold coins for property. Mm -hmm. You know, trading has been around since the beginning of time. Now, the type of trading that we do today, I don't think it's ever going to go away. Um, if fiat currency does go away, then obviously everything's going to be digital currency, um, which people trade cryptos all the times. But you could still go actively trade companies, mm -hmm. trade stocks, trade index funds, trade cryptos. You know, the most important thing that I've learned is, again, I started trading Forex. Mm. I don't trade Forex anymore. I trade indices. Mm -hmm. The knowledge that I have from trading Forex, I was able to transfer that into trading indices. I could just switch mm -hmm. my environments while making different tweaks to essentially the assets that I'm trading. And I'm exactly the same making probably, I, I, honestly, I'm making even more money now after I've made the switch. It's just little tweaks that you have to do. And that again, only comes with understanding with the career that you're involved mm -hmm. in. No, definitely. I couldn't agree more. I love that. Cause I think it just comes down to people being emotional. It's the, it's the same 100%. thing of fear and greed. And that's yeah, the fear side. Yeah. hundred percent. And uh, in regards to, Obviously, you've reached a very high level of success. And how do you keep yourself from getting complacent? How do you stay motivated? Honestly, now it was just like, well, first, I don't ever find myself in a position where I'm like, I'm good here. I'm, you know, I'm done. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the more money I have, it's just the more peace of mind that I have for me and my family. Now, my motivation today is my family to continue to push me forward, to continue to be able to provide the best quality mm. of life that I can for my family. That's one thing that people probably don't understand is like having more money isn't automatically going to make you happier, but the higher quality of a life you have will make you happier, mm -hmm. you know? So that's one thing that uh, keeps me motivated, honestly, and just keeps me pushing. Amazing to hear. And one uh, last question, and I'll yeah, do yeah. a quick fire question, which is the last question being, you said last year about the partying, right? Was there a correlation between the lifestyle outside of the charts and the results on the charts? A hundred percent. 100%. I know I could have made so much more money last year because last year, I mean, last year was a great year for me. I did two point, I did a little over 2.5 um, trading, but almost 50% of that was in a month after I stopped partying because I found out my wife was pregnant that same month. You know? The motivation, the drive. Yeah, yeah. I found out my wife was pregnant that same exact month. That's where I had my first seven figure month in mm -hmm. trading. Um, but I mean, I'm telling you, I was out partying every single week probably four times a week at times, just getting drunk. It killed my motivation to get on the charts. Um, and honestly, that's when a lot of the times I was either just break even or I made a little bit of money or luckily I didn't incur like huge losses. Um, but now that I'm more set in stone, like this year alone, I'm already at 2.5 million, wow. probably a little, probably a little bit less than 2.5 mm -hmm. million, but we're not even, we're halfway through the year and I'm already at what I entirely made mm. last year. And that's just from trading income and on a spread of different portfolios, mm. you know, which is a blessing that I've been able to be put into this position. But again, I, I have to thank a lot of it to my wife and my family. It's incredible. And you know, just a little uh, sort of side question off that, even though you're consistent, do you ever have times where you make like human error, like just a little mistake? Of course. Of course. I mean, just like we discussed previously, after I had my million dollar month, I lost a quarter million dollars off the bat because I was too overconfident mm. and I was sizing up too quickly. Definitely. I was sizing up too quickly. I think the biggest mistake that I made this year, I mean, I've made other mistakes that I've made money, but I've understood them mm -hmm. as mistakes. Like I had this $186,000 day trading the NASDAQ uh, recently, like two, like two weeks ago, I believe. Um, I traded outside of session looking for a swing mm. when I never trade outside of session. But I saw the opportunity there, and I was just lucky that the probabilities played out in my favor. Mm -hmm. If not, I would have lost 20 grand, but I was okay mm -hmm. with losing those $20,000. I accepted that $20,000 loss before it even happened, mm -hmm. you know, which makes trading just so much easier. That's, again, a human error where it paid off in my favor, mm -hmm. but there's other times that it hadn't paid off in my favor, 
Like I remember, again, like I, I normally never trade past 12. I took a trade past 12 o'clock. It was like at 12.30. It was after, what, what economic data was it? I forgot what it was. I think it was either, I think it was PPI or a Fed speaker. It was, it was one of the two. I traded after that and I ended up losing like $30,000 on that position within like three or four trades, mm -hmm. um, which is ridiculous because I should have never lost that money to begin with because I shouldn't have even been trading at 12.30. Mm -hmm. Fuck was I doing trading at 12.30? I always cut it off at 11, you know? So again, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Human error, it's gonna happen. I'm human at the end of the day, you know? That's it, no, I love that. And so we do like quick fire questions at the end, but I'll just give you the one that is reoccurring because I, I already asked quite a bunch of them already. Yeah, yeah. Which is just, if you could meet anyone in the past or in the present, you know, famous or not, you know, uh, just to spend time with and learn from, who would it be and why? <sighs> Man, if I could meet anybody, Listen, I'm a, I'm a religious guy. Uh, if I could meet anybody, I, I would meet Jesus Christ. Oh. 100%. Definitely. I think we know 100%. why as well already. <laughs> yeah, of course. Everyone would know why. I'm going to ask you one more, actually. Just okay. because, no, we did the interviews on the on the boat. I didn't get to catch you. Yeah, but yeah. there's one question we were asking, which is, if there was a charity boxing fight in the trading space, and you could pick one influencer <laughs> to fight, who would it be? Oh, man. One influencer to fight. There's already a couple at the top of my head. To be honest with you, I don't. Uh, I don't want to call anybody out. Um, man, this is the one question that's got him stuck. <laughs> the one question. It could be a friend. It's for charity at the end of the day. Um, for charity, let's. Uh, I don't know. I'm looking around. Yeah. Um, you know what? If it's for charity. I would uh I would uh, have a friendly friendly sparring match with uh, my boy AB. AB, yeah. Yeah. There we go. My boy we got AB. it. That was a hard one. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was, that was the hard hardest one. question was, of the thing. That was a hard one. I had some real answers to it, but I know, I know. Yeah. This this is the thing with the the trading space. This is why we need it. I think it will help the trading space. You know, I think <laughs> people have it. told me that before too. Like let's Honestly, set it up. We're gonna do it. This is That'd why I'm crazy. asking the question because I'm putting, <laughs> planting the seeds around, but. Raul, thank you very much for no, hosting thank you us. So much. Thank you for your time. And uh, I'll make sure your links are in the description below as well. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It was an honor being on here. No, no, it was, it was my honor completely. But thank you, everyone. Make sure you subscribe. Let us know your biggest takeaway in the comments below. And until next time, take care.